Gifts? Yes, they gave me this. Uno, zero, uno. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Zero. Last time, the Anatore fleet, led by Dave Mustaine, engaged the invading Dissith fleet and shot them down with lightning that erupted from his legendary rhythm guitar. Wait, this. Oh. Oh, very funny, Armit. Where's my script? Thank you. What an absolute coghole. <clears throat> Last time on RRF, the Anatore fleet, led by David Mad Thane, confronted the Dissith invaders under the command of Nestor Messina in the skies above Minagith. At first, the Anatore seemed victorious, but it was all a trap. From the grand stream above, a second Dissith fleet emerged and forced the Anatore to retreat. But then, in the face of total annihilation, a savior emerged from the clouds. It is the ship of death, the Sylvana, who confronts the Dissith cowards. And now, the continuation. Welcome, everyone. My name is Xander Fritz William H. Bettlesmith, and I'm here to welcome you to the second part of our first course at the Retro Future Research Foundation a top-tier educational institution in Arcology. And also the only one. Today, we'll be talking about a legendary engagement in the Lost Exile universe, the battle at the Dragon's Fangs. What went before, its ships and participants. But first, Last time we talked about the Battle of Minagis and the advent of total war. Before, wars on Prester had always been fought with honor and chivalry, but the actions of the Dissif commander, Nestor Messina, changed all that. He cared more for the future of his people who were on the run for an ice age than some dusty old code enforced by the guild. And for some reason, the guild let them get away with it. Now, the province of Minagis was being flooded by refugees that traversed the Grand Stream in rocket-like vessels that, well, were not very good. One can imagine the Anatri did not care for the refugees. From the Dissus' point of view, however, the situation was sink or swim. And the guild? Well, the guild did nothing other than sit back and enjoy the spectacle. Which, in all honesty, was the best both nations could hope for. They knew the guild was going to pull Claudia units at some point, because they could, and at any time. Amidst the awkward absence of the guild and the thundering of guns that could be heard all the way to the capital, the Anatorian Emperor Forrester sat on his throne, contemplating in silence. None of what transpired was entirely unexpected. It was only a matter of time before the guild would screw them over. And he knew this, because guild members told him so. A matter of fact, his own Prime Minister, Marius Vessianus of House Vessianus, was a former member of the Guild. Unbeknownst to the rest of the world, the Guild was not what it used to be. For 600 years they had overseen human development, but inevitably became corrupt. As the philosophers of old have warned, nothing is so permanent as a temporary measure. You see, the hourglass shape of Prester was very likely no accident. A Roche world is a binary planet system in which the planets are so close together they share an atmosphere. This weird cage-like thing might be to ensure these planets don't crash into each other as the so-called Roche limit is a very specific range of numbers and the smallest diversion might have apocalyptic consequences. Maintaining this half-world colony was one of the tasks of these transhumans, 
but everything comes to an end. At some point, it was time for humanity to return to its cradle. But someone in the guild said, no, let's not. Even though it was their reason Datra, it was not in their interest. Whether it was this or something else, the guild went to war itself. The four houses started to fight each other until one prevailed. Eracle. Maestro Delphine Eracle turned the already corrupt, nepotistic, yet somewhat decent organization into a hedonistic fret party who wanted to see the world burn for their enjoyment. Those who managed to escape would flee into an array and bring their technology with them. The military immediately put these to use. Marius Bessianus would even manage his own shipyard and would develop a new generation of warships, including military-style vanships. And the Emperor knew these would be the best because Bessianus had a personal stake in a war with the guild. And fortunately for the Prime Minister, his designs would engage each other in battle before they would fight the guild. How come? Remember the Silvana, the savior of the Anatari fleet at Minagis? Well, before we talk about this vessel, let's talk about the man who turned his incredible ship from mere awesome into a war machine of legend. Alex Rowe. Alex Rowe began his career on the military academy where he would meet his future wife. He distinguished himself from his peers, but instead of joining the military, he and his wife, Joris Bastianus, yes, that Bastianus, started their own courier service and flew the skies together as pilot and navigator. The couple became known as exceptional pilots, and with Joris' connections to the court, they would be chosen for a very special mission. In the year 645, Alex and Yuris were asked to traverse the Grand Stream, the storm on crack that separated Dissi from Anatarai. They would be accompanied by another friendship, piloted by Hamilcar Valka and George Head. Their mission? To deliver an offer of peace to Dissi and a request for an alliance against none other than the guild itself. It would have been a monumental achievement, as no pilot has ever crossed the Grand Stream before. Not to mention its historical significance. Would they have succeeded? However... One morning, a bandaged pilot appeared at the Valka household in Norkia. It was Alex, delivering the message to a grieving woman and the two children under her care that her husband and his friends would not be coming home. Their mission was a failure and a spectacular one at that. If these renowned pilots couldn't cross the Grand Stream, it was assumed nobody could. Things would remain the same. While admirals and politicians were adjusting their plans, Alex lived in solitude. All he cared about was gone. What remained was soon replaced by the darkness that was growing inside this broken man. In the Grand Stream, their friendship got attacked out of nowhere by a metal tentacle-like thing. It lashed out at a Velka's friendship first, and then focused its attention on Alex. Alex managed to recover the friendship from the blow, but this short moment of relief was rudely interrupted by a blood-curdling scream. He froze as he looked down from his friendship. This sight was the last thing he would ever see of his beloved wife. Alex saw no more point in going on living. He would even leave their friendship at the Valka household, convincing the children that it was their father's. A lie, of course. With the love of his life gone, all that remained was a burning hatred for the one he deemed responsible. 
far as he flew in that storm, trying to find a single reason to go on living. He got a glimpse of a young woman, dressed like a teenage drag queen, holding a bouquet of roses. Flower petals were being torn off by the winds as he observed the lonely, broken-hearted pilot and smiled. She smiled. It was that smile that drove him to go on living, his love now replaced by a bitter hatred that would motivate every decision he would make from that moment on. Alex Rowe had died. Long live the Rowe. For some of you, the puzzle pieces may have already fallen into place. His father-in-law, Marius Bassianus, offered to Rowe his weapon of choice. Silvana. A unique weapon system built around an obtained Claudia unit with engineer attached. Lucius Dagobert, another guild refugee from House Dagobert. This prevented the guild from meddling with their business, and the Rose business was ass-kicking, which he had an ample supply. The Silvana's main armament consists of two 12-inch forward guns, eight 10-inch port guns, and ten 8-inch rapid-fire deck cannons, because no birds are allowed to shit on this captain's ship. Later on, the Savannah also gained a multi-barreled rocket-propelled shell launcher in the aft, because it's funny to blast your opponents with which is essentially a jet-fueled ass cannon. This weapon was tested by the row on a ship called the Goliath, a claimed solus class ship that ran from the Battle of Minigis the moment the tables turned. But still, these cowards dare to challenge the row to a ship-to-ship -ship duel, and lost, in a spectacular fashion, I might add. No, this has nothing to do with today's story, but I just think it's hilarious that the Goliath got taken down with what was essentially a shrapnel-filled fart. The point is that the Silvana was designed for practicality rather than the traditional way of war and even had a bay with enough room for a squadron of six friendships, with spares equipped with machine guns and the ability to mount explosive ordnance. It also has two launch decks, one on top and one below. This is more an addition out of necessity than foresight. That is because the guild uses fighter-like craft called Starfish. These four-pointed bastards also have collapsible limbs, so they can be used as ground combatants, like frigging transformers. They're also highly maneuverable in the air, making them a nightmare for any anti-aircraft crew. Furthermore, the Silvana has room for two shuttles, one to carry officials, the second so the rogue can hand-deliver his opponent's asses back to them. Its crew complement is small for an Anaturian ship. About 250, but it is suggested it can carry three times that number. But the Silvana has no use for musketeers in their souped-up airbox. Instead, its crew carries automated machine pistols and anti-material rifles, like proper cockholes. Speaking of which, I think it is worth mentioning that its crew mainly consists out of outcasts and washed out recruits. Combine that with a captain who has no reputation to uphold, and what you're left with is essentially a privateer ship that happens to fly the Anatrian colors. And that is about the extent of their loyalty. And this is where we are going into our story proper. After Minagis, it became apparent that the guild was about to let the nations duke it out to the death. And war being a major strain on the dwindling water supply, time was running out. Fortunately, the Emperor had an ace in the hole. He had been sitting on it, waiting at the opportune time to reveal his hand. But the war forced him to act prematurely. You see... The guild had a secret, a weapon so powerful it had a passcode divided across the four houses. 
This past race was called the Four Mysteria. Without these past races, this weapon refused to work. The Emperor had made it a priority to recover these codes and task the Sylvana with this secret mission. Recovering the first two pieces was easy. Minister Bassianis and the engineer from House Dagobert gave Rowe their Mysteria willingly. For the phrase of House Hamilton, he had to pay an exuberant amount at an auction. That's a too long a story. The final Mysterium was granted to him by a defector from House Iracle, who is said to have been the brother of Delphine herself. I heard from a source this was because he had the hots for one of his crew members. I don't know, like I said, they are a bunch of degenerates. However, there is a fifth component. What is this fifth component, you wonder? Folks, I don't like jerking you around. It's a bloody magical girl. A darn adorable one of death. Like, really darn adorable, so, yeah. This is Elvis Hamilton of House Hamilton, in case you're still wondering. She is the granddaughter of the previous guild maestro who got purged. Through her, anyone can control the weapon only known as Exile. Thanks to the effort of various friendship couriers, Doro managed to get his hands on this little girl, which saying it out loud sounds rather creepy. The guild, however, was well aware of this fact, and time was of the essence. Therefore, the Emperor was anxious to get the girl to exile, but therein lay the problem. Nobody knew where it was. On top of that, the Anotrine fleet was too occupied with Minagis, yet taking control of exile was the Emperor's only option. But he was dealing with the Row, a coghole that did not like him very much, nor trusted his intentions. Also, did I mention the girl is adorable? The Emperor got tired of waiting and sent a special task force to retrieve his cargo. The head of this task force would be led by none other than the amazing and magnificent Vincent Alzey. Oh, at least that's what I'm told for, I have no idea what he actually accomplished, beyond having the most awesome ship design at his disposal. The Urbanus. The basic premise of the ship could not be simpler. Take a van ship, expand it by 3000%, add some guns and torpedo tubes, and on top of it all, mother freaking chainsaws. Really, really big chainsaws. Why, you ask? Because chainsaws! Your argument is invalid. So, yes, the Urbanus is a ramming ship. I guess that when the Emperor asked for a ship to stick it to that hoe over there, they took it very literally. Apart from that, it was pure and trying technology. No guild units required. Its propulsion system was typically used for fan ships. Furthermore, it was based on the design of the Sylvana, so its maneuverability was about the same. But overall has less firepower and no fan ship detachment. It does, however, come equipped with six concealed 25 caliber guns and a single quad mounted 32 inch mine launcher who'll give anyone a bad day who dares to come in too close. Despite being a ramming ship, the Urbanus has a single 32 inch torpedo launch tube in front. The first of its kind that is capable to take down any ship from long distance. There is a second launch tube, but I am going to keep that a surprise for now. Along with a another feature. So, yeah. The Urbanus is quite a beast, that would be more than a match for the Sylvana. But before we get into that, let's talk about the prelude to the battle. You see, Alze and the Row happen to be old friends. So when Alze was ordered to fetch the cargo, he managed to arrange a meeting between himself and the Row. 
bonding over coffee, Alze explained that he was expected to deliver the girl and the four Mysteria to the Emperor. But to that, the Row responded with, Nah. Alze asked his old friend if he was sure about this, for disobeying the Emperor could only mean one thing. That was Alze's mistake. For one cannot threaten the Row with a good time. And so it happens the French left the tower as enemies. Later, as soon as the Row returned to the Zilvana, he prepared for battle. He was well aware that Alze did not come alone and didn't expect to have a chance in a straight engagement. So he decided to set a trap inside of the dragon's fangs. A treacherous piece of mountainous terrain you won't pick for a family cruise if you know what I mean. Then again, I have an employer who thinks that a two-week stay in the tundra is a great idea for a paid vacation in a tent. But I digress. Oh, oh, wait, I, I have to take this. You know? What, what do you want to know? Oh, uh, Bowler Hat Tom, uh, Steamy Wonders, and Jelly Mancer. Who? Oh, no, he, uh... He's looking for a new job. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Bye. <clears throat> okay, where was I? Right, the Dragon's Fangs. A formation of jagged rocks that gave the area its name. To make it more unpleasant, it's foggy as hell, making it a nightmare to navigate. But ideal terrain when you are outnumbered six to one. The row also had another advantage. For he knew that Alze needed to capture his crew alive. A fact that annoyed Alze extremely, for nobody crosses the row and expects it to make it out in one piece. So, as far as he was concerned, he had no choice but to engage the row, as if he wanted to sink him. But would he succeed? The battle began at the outskirts of the Dragon Spanks, where the Sylvana's acoustic radar picked up a sonar pulse. They spotted three ships, all Urbanus class. The Sylvana attacked them from their blind spot and managed to cripple one of the ships. But the other two vessels were still getting in close fast, and the Sylvana lured them in between the fangs. It became hard sailing from this point on. But the Sylvana had an advantage. Vanships. Connected by radio cables, the Vanship surrounded the Sylvana, serving as its eyes and relaying all information in real time. But even their view range was severely limited. Meanwhile, Alze was aware of how the row operated and expected the Sylvana to lure them in between the fangs. But Alze had an edge of his own. Urbanus glass was constructed in secret, and a row did not know about its many useful features, such as its concealed gun turrets. But it also had the ability to run silent and ambush its target at short range, and Alze intended to make the best use of that. First, Alze ordered the ships in pursuit to blast the rock formations around the Sylvana, blocking off all possible escape routes. This also deafened the Sylvana's listening post, who then failed to detect the two enemy vassals in front of them, running in silent mode. All of a sudden, the crew of the Sylvana would be surprised by two enemy ships which emerged from the fog in front of them. These two would then surround her and put their chainsaws to work. When these disengaged, the damage was manageable, but the Savannah was in a precarious situation. All escape routes were blocked, and the ship could not descend any lower. Going up, on the other hand, meant exposing themselves to three enemy ships, laying in waiting. 
The escorting Venships managed to blind the enemy vessels with smoke trails, but it would only postpone the inevitable. The situation on board the Silvana seemed hopeless when one of the enemy ships, the Sebastianus, turned about and once again connected the chainsaw with the Silvana's port armor. The crew of the Silvana had to hold on for their life as the ship shook underneath their feet. Pinned in place by the cutters, it was only a matter of time before the second ship would return and finish the job. It was time for drastic measures. If subtlety does not do the job, it is time to act like a dick. This is when the row ordered the ship to go full throttle, and when the Silvana engaged her engines, she pushed the Sebastianus upward like a boss. Meanwhile, on board the Urbanus, Alze was unaware of the obscure defense. All seemed to be going according to his plan, until two flares rose from the clouds, warning the Sebastianus was in trouble. Right away, Alze sent in one of his ships, the Georgius, in to assist. But as the Georgius approached, all of a sudden, the Sebastianus would rise out from the fog like a monster from a pop-up book just before the bow of the Georgius. In front of his eyes, the Admiral saw two of his super-secret military vessels collide like a couple of chumps and explode together in spectacular fashion. After that embarrassment, Vincent was even more determined than ever to bring down his nemesis, and ordered two of his remaining ships to pin the Zilvana in place so he could deliver the finishing blow. Remember the second tube I mentioned? Yeah, it's a bloody harpoon. You see, ships that move are hard to ram, so instead of going after their targets, the Urbanus makes the enemy come to them. And if they feel like it, they can always torpedo their pinned opponent for shits and giggles. So imagine the Roe's annoyance when his ship got harpooned from both flanks of the ship, disabling the Sylvanas navigation. But one does not pin the row. As both ships reeled themselves towards the Sylvana and the Urbanus moved in for the kill, Row ordered to deploy the aft launchers. Set the engines to maximum and finally order the launchers to be fired. Alze recognized immediately what was happening in front of him. The combined force of the engines and the shot of the aft weapon gave the Sylvana an incredible boost that pulled both attached vessels off course. Meanwhile, the hail of shells devastated the surrounding rock, making them crash down on both Urbanus class vessels, which were dragged helplessly behind the Sylvana like two wiener dogs on a leash. The Urbanus barely managed to evade this clusterfuck in progress and disengaged. It was a close call, but Alze lived. However, as he looked on, the Sylvana got struck by the rocks and before long would be dragged down beneath the clouds towards the unhospitable rocks below. And with that sank the Emperor's price, together with Alze's career. He didn't just lose four of the top of the line ships, he lost the only thing that could have won the war against the guild. And so Vincent Alze would be demoted for his efforts. So, so what? Is this the end for the role with the Sylvana? You may just have answered your own question. And we'll talk about that next time. And that was the lesson for today. 
It took me longer than necessary to make this video because recording with a stuffed nose made me sound like one of the three stooges. Almost forgot to include a thanks to Edward Lacour for doing the voice work on the intro. He has done professional voice work in the past before and I'll link to him. And I'll link to his work down below. So, if you want to help elevate my frustration, please consider supporting us on Subscribestar or Patreon. We are currently looking into creating our own fiction as well that is going to require original art. So, we'll need your support. If you have a favorite franchise you want us to cover, please send us your recommendations and maybe we'll give it a similar treatment in the future. Finally, a thank you to the 113th Anachronistic Grenadiers, the Clockwork Fisticuff Society, and the Steampunk Beginner's Guide for letting me use their footage. We intend to do longer sketches in the future. Hope to see you all here next time. Next time. Next time.